heart of the Brazilian Amazon, the rainforest is a living entity, its voice woven from the polyphonic chorus of flora and fauna. Explorers speak of it in reverent tones, and locals treat it with a mix of respect and sacredness. As a sound ethnographer, I've collected sonic landscapes from around the world, but nothing prepared me for the mystery I'd encountered deep in the Brazilian rainforest, a lullaby that didn't belong to any human tongue, yet carried the weight of ancient lullabies hummed by mothers across millennia. The rumor was prevalent among the native communities. They spoke of Ocanto de la Floresta, the song of the forest, a lullaby that the forest sings to itself when night lays its dark veil over the Amazon. Intrigued and armed with cutting-edge recording equipment, I ventured into the dense labyrinth of trees and waterways led by Rodrigo, a local guide whose knowledge of the forest was intuitive, gained from a lifetime of coexistence. As darkness enveloped the forest, a profound stillness settled in, a pause in the continuous murmur that characterized the daytime hours. Rodrigo signaled for us to stop and listen. The air grew thick with anticipation, each moment stretching, as if time itself was holding its breath. And then it began. A melody emerged from the depths of the forest, delicate and haunting. It floated on the night air, ethereal yet distinct, a sequence of notes that resembled a lullaby, cradling everything it touched in a gentle embrace. Though no human lips were shaping these sounds, the tune reverberated with an emotional timber that struck a universal chord. My fingers trembled slightly as I set up the recording equipment, but when I pressed the record button, the melody suddenly faltered, its notes scattering like startled birds. A wave of chills cascaded down my spine. The forest had sensed the intrusion. Its song was not for capturing. It was a gift for those willing to listen, to be present. We should not try to cage what is free, Rodrigo whispered, his words imbued with a wisdom that transcended the moment. As we trekked back, the forest resumed its nocturnal serenade the notes lingering behind us like a gossamer trail. Though I returned with empty audio files, the resonance of that night stayed with me, humming softly in the corners of my memory. Back in my world of decibels and frequencies, where every sound is dissected and analyzed, the Amazon's mysterious lullaby defies categorization. It has seeped into my own understanding of sound, of its primal power to communicate beyond words or definitions. Now, when people ask about the most extraordinary sound I've ever heard, I think of the Amazon's lullaby, its invisible notes woven into the very fabric of the rainforest. While the experience eludes quantification, it thrives in the realm of the inexplicable. And isn't it precisely these enigmas, these whispers from beyond the veil of comprehension, that make our world infinitely richer, a symphony of unspoken connections? The Egyptian desert is an unforgiving expanse, a sea of sand and heat where survival depends on understanding its capricious moods. The locals respect its potential for illusions. It's a place where mirages are more trustworthy than maps. I've trekked through numerous deserts during my time as a travel journalist, chasing stories that often skirt the edge of myth and reality but nothing prepared me for what I would witness in the arid plains between the Sinai Peninsula and the Nile Valley. It was the peak of an intense heat wave, where the air seemed to melt into the sand, and vice versa. My guide, Yusef, a weathered man with deep-set eyes and a face carved by the desert wind, had warned me that extreme heat could play tricks on the mind. Yet, as we ventured deeper into the barren landscape, a whisper began to crawl its way into our awareness, a murmur that seemed both near and far, echoing across time rather than space. And then, amid the shimmering waves of heat rising from the sand, 
shapes coalesced, a procession materializing from the blur of light and color, as if painted by the brush strokes of the sun. They were figures cloaked in white linen and golden jewelry, their eyes lined with coal. Chariots adorned with ornate designs followed them, drawn by creatures that seemed half horse, half myth. At the helm stood a figure of regal authority, a pharaoh crowned with the symbols of Upper and Lower Egypt. My pulse quickened. Every journalistic instinct screamed to document this spectral parade. Yet my hands trembled as I lifted the camera, its weight suddenly imbued with the gravity of the unfolding scene. I pressed the shutter button, half in disbelief, half in awe. The procession moved with a solemn grace, their eyes focused on a horizon that belonged to another epoch. Their mouths moved in silent prayers or incantations, words that had perhaps once been uttered in temples long eroded by time. And the most startling thing was their gaze. They looked through us rather than at us, as if we were the apparitions, translucent and irrelevant. Then, as silently as they'd appeared, the figures began to dissolve into the air, their outlines blurring until they became indistinguishable from the rippling heat. The desert resumed its monochrome stillness, the spell broken but not forgotten. Yusef looked at me, his eyes reflecting the profound complexity of what we had witnessed. You can't capture the soul of the desert with a lens, he said softly. It shows you what it wants you to see when it wants you to see it. When I later examined the photos, they showed nothing but expanses of sand and sky, as if the desert had guarded its secret from the prying eyes of technology. But the experience remains etched in my memory, a story that defies categorization or rational explanation. Was it a mirage induced by the unforgiving heat? Or had the veil between past and present grown thin in that inscrutable landscape? I can't provide a definitive answer, but as someone who documents the myriad wonders of our world, I've come to cherish the enigmas that resist simplification. In a landscape as ancient as the Egyptian desert, who's to say where reality ends and illusion begins? After all, some mysteries are meant to be experienced not explained. The house was a deal too good to pass up, an old Victorian slightly worn around the edges but full of character situated on a quiet street lined with mature trees. Sarah and I felt an immediate connection, an unspoken agreement passing between us the moment we stepped inside. We moved in within the month. Could use a fresh coat of paint, Sarah said, her voice bouncing off the empty walls. I laughed, and then a second later heard another laugh, a soft, hollow replication that settled uneasily in the room. Not my laugh, not Sarah's. We exchanged glances but shrugged it off. Weeks rolled on. We unpacked painted walls, build rooms with furniture and photographs, yet the echo remained. If we laughed, it laughed, just moments too late. If we raised our voices, the house seemed to speak back in a tone that was never quite ours. It's old, I rationalized. Old houses have quirks. Sarah looked unconvinced but nodded. Yeah, quirks, let's go with that. Days turned into weeks. The echo became an invisible tenant, woven into the fabric of our daily lives. But as time passed, it grew less mimetic and more distinct, its timber deepening, its laughter souring into something like a jeer. It's not normal, Dave, Sarah finally admitted one night. We need to find out what it is. I nodded, my gut echoing her unease. We started with simple tests, trying to catch the echo off guard, determine its origin, shouting into empty rooms, recording the spaces with our phones. 
but every recording played back clean, as if the echo refused to be caught. Frustrated, we invited an acoustics expert to assess the house. He walked through each room, taking measurements, scratching his head. The structure's sound, no reason for any sort of echo, he declared, packing his gear, and certainly not the kind you described. Yet the echo persisted, growing louder with each passing day. In an act of last resort, we brought in a medium, a small woman with graying hair and a face etched with lines of experience. She walked through the house, pausing in the living room where the echo was strongest. Closing her eyes, she said, there's another layer to this house, another skin. It's trying to communicate, but it's trapped between worlds. Can you free it? Sarah asked, her voice tinged with desperation. The medium shook her head. No, but you need to leave. It's growing stronger with your presence, feeding off your emotions. We didn't need any more convincing. We moved out within the week, finding a modern apartment devoid of echoes or invisible tenants. The old house was left behind, but the echo has never really left us. It's become a yardstick of the unexplainable, a reminder that some walls don't just hold up a roof, they hold secrets too profound for our understanding. It taught us to listen, not just to the noises that fill a space, but to the silence that seeks to speak, to the echo that isn't our own but yearns to be heard. In a remote Japanese village of Koyasan, tucked away among misty mountains and ancient cedar forests, lies a mailbox unlike any other. It stands next to a small Shinto shrine, unremarkable in appearance, but extraordinary in its story. For the past several decades, every year on the same day, this mailbox receives a letter. The handwriting is delicate, the words penned in classical Japanese the prose steeped in poetic nuance. What makes this phenomenon inexplicable isn't just the content, but the context. These letters bear current date stamps, but they are addressed from a woman named Yuki to her lover Hiroshi, both of whom, according to the text, lived in the 1500s. They speak of love and war, of seasons changing and empires falling, as if plucked from a time long past, yet mailed in the present. I stumbled upon this tale while in Japan for a research project. Intrigued by the blend of romance and mystery, I decided to visit Koyasan. I was there on the day the next letter was due to arrive, waiting beside the mailbox with a mixture of skepticism and anticipation. At precisely noon, the postman came by on his bicycle, dropping a single envelope into the mailbox before pedaling away, seemingly unaware of his role in this mystery. The villagers, who had long accepted this occurrence as a quirk of their secluded community, graciously allowed me to examine the letter. The paper was fine washy, its texture betraying nothing of its age or origin. The date stamp was crisp and contemporary jarringly at odds with the archaic kanji script describing cherry blossoms and samurai battles. I read the letter over and over, captivated by the raw emotion and historical detail within its lines. Yuki spoke of a warlord who had recently swept through their region, of the ache she felt with Hiroshi away, likely drafted into this new conflict. It ended with a plea for them to be reunited, if not in this life, then in the next, beneath the same cherry blossoms they had admired together. Who were Yuki and Hiroshi? Why were their letters manifesting in our time? The villagers had theories, mostly involving spirits or unfulfilled destinies, but no one knew for sure. While my rational mind sought a logical explanation, perhaps a skilled and dedicated hoaxer or an elaborate cultural performance, another part of me resonated with the emotive prose the depth of feeling that spanned centuries. 
could love indeed be so powerful as to puncture the fabric of time. My stay in Koyasan eventually came to an end, and I returned to my world of academic rigor and deadlines. But the story of Yuki and Hiroshi lingers in my thoughts, a love letter to the enigmatic and the unexplained. Every so often, when the weight of the present becomes too oppressive, I find myself drifting back to that mist-shrouded village, to the mailbox that serves as a portal to another time. It remains a mystery without a key, a question without an answer, yet its very existence is a testament to the enduring, perhaps even transcendent nature of human emotion, a love so profound that it defies the boundaries of time. Dark wood, worn-out leather, and a dimness split only by the occasional beam of yellow light from antiquated lamps. That was O'Connor's pub. A pint of Guinness in hand, I leaned back and surveyed the room. A mix of locals and tourists, young and old, each lost in conversation or contemplation. Wait for it, said Liam, the barman, wiping a glass with the skill of someone who's been at it for decades. For what? The lullaby comes on its own every night. I glanced at the jukebox in the corner. It was an old thing, a relic of a bygone era. Unplugged, Liam told me, years ago. But it played one song every night without fail, a haunting lullaby that no one had been able to identify. Right on cue, a melody filled the air soft yet piercing through the ambient noise like a whisper that refuses to be drowned out. Notes hung in the room, each one like a drop of rain that touches the soul but leaves no trace. A melody I couldn't place, yet felt like I'd known all my life. Sweet dreams, Liam said with a wink as the last note faded away. That night sleep came quickly, but not without dreams. A cottage, simple but filled with warmth. An old woman sat by the fireplace, humming the lullaby. Her eyes, a shade of gray I'd never seen, locked on to mine. They seemed to carry the weight of countless untold stories. She sang, and with each note I felt an odd sense of comfort. It was as if her voice wove serenity around me. I wanted to ask her who she was, but words wouldn't form. She seemed to understand, and with a nod, she went on singing until her image faded into the dawn light seeping through my curtains. The next day I returned to O'Connor's pub, driven by an unshakable curiosity. Liam greeted me with a knowing smile. Heard it, did you? And dreamt it, too. He nodded. You're not the first, won't be the last. We think she's someone who lived long ago, early 1800s, perhaps. No one really knows. But whoever she is, she's a part of this place now. I looked at the jukebox, inanimate, unplugged, yet vibrant in its mystery. I could almost hear the lullaby again, a tune as ageless as the hills and skies of Ireland itself. The mystery of the lullaby and the old woman remain unsolved, like an ancient tale told in hushed voices. But every night at O'Connor's pub, when the clock hands moved toward midnight, I knew the jukebox would play its song, and the old woman would sing her lullaby to those willing to listen. A timeless connection, conjured in dreams but rooted in a reality that transcended both time and explanation. I've been a cog in the machine of corporate America for years, spending my days in a glass and steel structure that reaches skyward in a show of modernity. It's a building where elevators are usually prompt, taking us to our respective floors like well-trained horses. Yet there was something off about Elevator D, something that made the hairs on the back of my neck prickle 
every time I stepped inside. Most days it worked just fine, but every once in a while, instead of reaching my floor, the display would flash zero and the doors would open. The first time it happened, I stepped out, bewildered, into what appeared to be the same building, except the air was thicker, tinged with the smell of cigarette smoke and stale coffee. Reception desk had an old rotary phone. The computers were bulky machines with cathode ray tube monitors, and the people, well, they were dressed like they'd walked out of a 1980s corporate manual. Suits with padded shoulders, men with mustaches that didn't seem ironic, and everyone engrossed in actual paper newspapers. I remember feeling disoriented, questioning my sanity as I wandered around the floor. When I got back in the elevator, it took me directly to my floor, in the year I belonged to, as though nothing had happened. I convinced myself it was stress, or maybe a prank orchestrated by the tech-savvy millennials in IT. However, it happened again, this time to my coworker, Lisa, who emerged from elevator D with a look of bewilderment that I recognized immediately. We compared notes, verifying the impossible, that we had both traveled to the same bygone era. Our stories attracted a mixture of disbelief and awe and unease among our colleagues. We considered reporting it, but who would believe us? Elevator D became an enigma, a subject of jokes and nervous laughter. Some have claimed to have heard faint music emanating from its walls, the distant notes of a classic 80s rock ballad. Others felt a sudden drop in temperature as they passed it. But for me, Elevator D became an object of fascination, a tear in the fabric of reality that defied explanation. Each time the doors opened to floor zero, I found myself peering into a past untouched by the digital age, its people unaware that they were specters in a temporal anomaly. I never ventured far, never interacted with the people there. It felt intrusive, as if I were trespassing on a past that wasn't mine to disturb. So I'd linger near the elevator, studying the faces and fashions of a time I'd lived through but barely remembered, before returning to my own decade. The phenomenon continued sporadically over the years. New hires were initiated into the lore of Elevator D, although it remained unclear whether it was a technological glitch or something inexplicable a sliver of another era sandwiched into our modern world. What does it mean? I still don't know. All I have are questions. Is Floor Zero aware of us, or are we just phantoms flickering in and out of their reality? Are there other elevators in other buildings that perform the same temporal magic? For now, Elevator D remains an unsolved mystery in a building otherwise dominated by logic and routine, a vertical time machine encased in steel, forcing us to confront the ephemeral nature of time itself, a silent reminder that the layers of the past are closer than we think, hidden just beyond the doors that separate what is from what once was. Antarctica is not a place for the faint-hearted. It's a vast expanse where white and silence bleed into each other, rendering the landscape a blank canvas on which the mind can paint its deepest fears. As a research meteorologist stationed in McMurdo, I've braved conditions that would break a lesser soul. Howling winds, endless darkness, and temperatures that can freeze a man's spirit as easily as his flesh. But it's not the harshness of the climate that unnerves me. It's the whispers that come with the snowstorms. They're more than just auditory hallucinations. They've saved lives, including my own. You don't speak of them openly, those whispers, 
Antarctica has a way of humbling you, of making human words seem inadequate against its majestic and cruel indifference. But among the crew, we all know, when the snowstorms hit and the whispers come, you listen. It happened during a routine data collection mission. The sky had already turned an ominous gray, a storm brewing on the horizon, but we thought we'd have enough time. We thought wrong. Within minutes, visibility dropped to near zero, the snow a white haze that erased the distinction between earth and sky. The icy wind howled like a feral beast, gnawing through layers of thermal clothing. And then, through the cacophony, I heard it. A whisper so faint it could have been mistaken for a figment of my imagination. Left, it breathed, an ethereal wisp of sound snatched away by the gusts. My instincts screamed against it. Left would take us farther away from base, but something about that whisper felt different, like a thread of warmth woven into the frozen air. I looked at my fellow researcher, her eyes wide, her lips quivering with unspoken recognition. Did you hear it too? I mouthed. She nodded. Against reason, against logic, we veered left. The snow deepened each step an effort that seemed to drain years from our lives. The whisper persisted, guiding us through the storm as if an invisible hand was carving out a path for us to follow. Straight, it beckoned. Right, it urged, each direction accompanied by a growing sense of urgency. After what seemed an eternity, the tempest began to recede as if the elements had decided we'd earned our reprieve. Ahead of us, barely visible through the lifting mist, was the outline of an old supply cache. Forgotten by time, but marked on no current map, it offered temporary refuge and, crucially, a radio. By the time we were rescued, the storm had unleashed its full fury on our original path. Had we not veered left when we did, we would have walked straight into an ice crevasse, an abyss hidden by the snow, our bodies forever entombed in Antarctic white. No one spoke of the whispers after that, but sometimes, in the middle of a snowstorm, when human voices are drowned by nature's roar, I'd catch Sarah's eye and see reflected there the inexplicable. It's as if Antarctica itself reached out to guide us through its icy maze, as if the very air we breathed bore messages from an unknown sender. Does it make me question the science I've dedicated my life to? The empirical reality I thought I knew? No but it makes me wonder about the hidden dimensions of the world, the inexplicable phenomena that lie just beyond our understanding. In the realm of Antarctic white, where the line between life and death is as thin as the edge of a razor, those whispers are a reminder of our vulnerability, our insignificance in the grand scheme. Yet they're also a testament to the enduring mysteries of the world unquantifiable threads that weave their way through the tapestry of human experience. And it's in that delicate balance between knowing and not knowing that I find my humility, my awe, and the endless fuel for the questions that drive us forward into the unknown. Thank you.